Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It's Thursday, 23rd of April. I'm uh, just going to quickly start off by saying uh, if you haven't done so before and if you're new to the channel, uh, then obviously thanks for joining us. Please do subscribe for more daily content. Uh, but here's the Amplify Trading website. So I know we do have a bit of a mixture between people who, who are generally traders who tune in to, to listen to the briefing, uh, but we also have quite a few students as well looking to just generally improve their, their kind of knowledge and awareness of what's going on in markets. So when you're on our homepage, uh, there's a couple of different options, um, but specifically the red and blue ones here for if you are a trader or if you're a student. Um, this is uh, predominantly aimed here at those who are uh, either brand new to trading or those who have been retail trading but are looking for more uh, kind of answers in a sense to us being I guess on the professional side of the prop world how do we kind of construct our strategies how do we manage our psychology how do I apply macro fundamentals to, to trading uh, and so on so everything here if you click on that button it will give you a bit more uh, detail this is the kind of trader section of our of our website uh, do check it out when you uh, get a moment here's the guys the kind of senior team which we've all been involved with our new one week intensive program which we've been running since the beginning of the week i know a couple of the guys are listening now so very good morning to you um but yeah it's been great because with that um you know one of the uh, i guess silver linings of um, having to work from home and the lockdown being apparent for everyone globally it's meant that we've basically taken everything virtual uh, we were already had that capability but it's the first time we've really kind of we've not been able to obviously be on the, the physical trading floor in the city and so we've done everything online and and so far hopefully so good uh, and the beauty has been we've had guys tuning in um, you know working with us from Morocco um, from Northern Ireland um, from you know lots of different places um, so you know it's been great to have that kind of ability um, rather than just teaching someone you know kind of face to face in that sense so check that out uh, the link will be in the video uh, to have a look at but you know let's talk markets let's just have a look at what's going on and actually it's a fairly fairly tame open I would say um, you know it's a strange thing and, and I was kind of inferring this in yesterday's briefing about that idea that now we've had that massive shock event with oil uh, I did have a feeling that you know the market would become somewhat desensitized to the second time round uh, I think the other thing we were talking about yesterday was the idea that the June futures contract could be targeted uh, and certainly it was uh, and now there has been as we're going to discuss some movements that's happened to counteract that uh, happening again so you know we were talking about the fact that you know what happened to the May WTI contract was probably going to happen to June and everyone came to that same idea and kind of front run front ran that and liquidated a lot of those positions that has caused some degree of variance but we have settled now a little bit in oil and you know as I was kind of saying before and, and we're going to look at a note in a moment from JP Morgan I kind of agree with them it's kind of look I don't really think that oil move really is a systemic risk to be quite quite honest I mean if it were you would have seen a much bigger kind of correlated fallout in other assets ie say equities for example and that really hasn't happened when I mean, we have a little bit of downside but as you can see here we had a positive close on Wall Street the Dow was up to shy of 500 points we reversed pretty much half of that sell-off that we saw during this kind of um, this super contango situation that we've had in the oil market and so all things back to kind of normal in a way um, don't get me wrong though the oil situation is far from solved but the important point I think from a broader market perspective um, it hasn't um, and now that it, it's kind of gone over its worst and people are now more aware of this type of thing outside of say specifically the oil market I think I think the ability for that story to really rock things uh, has diminished quite considerably at this point going forward. Um, otherwise, the other asset classes, I mean, oil in itself, uh, this bottom chart here in the futures is up about a dollar and a half, we're up just over 15 bucks. Um, we're going to talk about Trump. He's made some uh, fairly interesting tweets. I get a little bit suspect with the timing, given how low oil has been for him to try and bump prices back up again. But uh, as I said, we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, gold pretty flat uh, technically up at around the peak of the overnight Asia Pacific high worth keeping an eye on that came in at around 1745 we're up marginally about three bucks 
Uh, the Dixie off just a touch, one tenth. So both major pairs, Euro dollar and cable, just coming up a, t uh, a little bit as European participants have come in. Uh, and, and T notes are pretty flat, slight underperformance in the Bund. Uh, there's been a couple of comments out in regards to the the ECB and the FT last night that I was tweeting about. Um, so if you don't just follow my handle on Twitter, I tend to you know never stop looking at the news basically so it can be quite useful sometimes I put out things at some uh, weird times of day just because I'm, I tend to be quite glued to my screens at the moment uh, it might be quite useful for you uh, but look let's let's go through the news because that's what hopefully I can help on I'll leave the kind of technicals to to you guys and starting off with a quick update on coronavirus I know we've kind of been sidetracked almost it feels like in the last couple of days so so focused on oil but you know, there's, there still is this COVID-19 situation, of course. Uh, so a quick run through of some of the top level headlines. And this is being one of the first ones. So the UK chief medical advisor yesterday spoke and said the chance of having a vaccine in the next calendar year is incredibly small. And until then, we need to rely on disruptive social distancing. Now, uh, this is one of the things that we were saying, if you remember, last week in the briefings. I was very bearish when that Gilead Sciences headline came out. I thought the market was over-exaggerating given the kind of emotiveness of the subject matter about finding, let's say, a cure, a vaccine. Um, I was always of the opinion that medically getting that into the point of passing these kind of trial stages and then getting to the point of manufactured and distributed was going to be a, a very long timeline. So... For me, this is exactly what I feel we've been saying in terms of our, our desk's view uh, about the timeline. I've always thought governments have had to balance this kind of this double edged sword of trying to politically uh, appear to be in control of the situation. But pretty much every government pledge across every single country has been broken in terms of the deadlines that they had set, whether that be testing. Uh, whether that be lockdowns and all these other things. So to me, this is completely unexpected. But unfortunately, the reality is um, that if you, know, if you were hoping that, let's say, the, uh, the lockdown being unwound was going to be a fairly smooth, quick, orderly process, and that meant that you could go about your normal working uh, and, uh, I guess, personal lifestyles, unfortunately, that's going to be uh, not the case. Social distancing, as we said a few weeks ago, is probably going to be a staggered fashion, but over several months, given this nature of the secondary waves that could come apparent and then until a vaccine might become available later on. So, yeah, it's kind of reality hitting home a little bit. And certainly when people talk about the shape of the recovery, um, this is going to be much more kind of graduated then in terms of um, how quickly that might happen. But to be quite honest, when we look at charts and markets this morning, um, nothing's really moving on the back of this because I don't really think it's that unexpected to be quite honest and um, the the point being now I think you know and I get this question a lot you know is the current is coronavirus priced in well yes I would say it is priced in for all things remaining equal as we are at the moment I guess the testing time will come when we do actually start to relax the lockdowns in graduated phases at what point and how severe then is the pickup which is going to happen in renewed cases. Uh, that's for me is going to determine whether or not the governments can strike the right balance uh, and therefore comes to test that they face. You know, the longer it remains locked down, the more economically damaging it is, but obviously the cost is immense. The cost is loss of human life. So here elsewhere, New York deaths were at their lowest rate since early April. Uh, Spain's parliament's backed uh, the PM's request in order for a further extension of a state emergency aid until uh, the 9th of May. Uh, the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin has been out yesterday and anticipates most of the economy will restart by the end of August. Again, this is this is crazy talk for me. Stephen Mnuchin saying the economy is going to be pretty much completely reopened by August. Remember, Trump said it was going to be completely open by Easter. Um, again, I wouldn't really get too tied into the emotional your political view to be honest he says these things because he has to say them um, whether that comes from Trump's order or not um, he's just trying to convey a message to the public you know he, it's not going to be completely reopened by by August I can tell you that now uh, but again it doesn't really impact markets that's the important point remember politics and what gets said and market impact can be a little bit disconnected at times well let's move on 
Let's talk about oil then. I'm just going to do a very quick recap. And, and certainly things have steadied, I would say, a little bit. We're, we're definitely out of that period of this kind of euphoric movement that we were seeing. And, you know, I was watching the ladder when it did go negative at the time. It was, it was pretty insane watching the, the movement. But we're looking here on my, my screen is the, the kind of active WTI futures contract. So this would be like a, if you were using a trading platform, the continuation chart. So kind of mapping the, the front month contract. So it, all, it kind of shapes in the, uh, the May and June movement. And obviously we went negative near $40, uh, but we've now steadied and we're trading 15 uh, this morning, which is above. Um, so we have settled uh, as to be expected. And there has been a couple of different things that have happened in order to address some of the main problems. And one of the main things that, that was happening was this US oil ETF um, and Bloomberg talking about this this morning. Uh, so basically, one the, the key summary here is this. Uh, the USO has moved further out the oil futures curve for a second day. Uh, now, we've done some previous videos on the channel, so do check them out where we've, we've talked about uh, the curve and what that should look like in normal times in terms of contango versus backwardation and extreme contango that we have now. So check those out when you when you get a moment. But let me just kind of run you through a few different things here. So why why is this important? Well, the USO is the biggest oil traded uh, exchange traded fund in in the world basically, and it's reshuffled a mix of futures that it owns to track crude prices, extending the average. Um, expiration date. Now, one of the problems that led to what we saw, it was it, it typically would be heavily geared and it would roll from month to month, the front month contract. But as you saw then, when we have a, this storage issue that we face now, both in the US and somewhat now globally, it can lead to these massive runs on people just needed to get out, even a loss, let's say, of those those contracts. And so in order to evert this type of thing, they the fund which are the single single largest owner of WTI crude futures at any one point in time, they've moved um, its money into contracts expiring in August and September while reducing exposure in June and July. So basically they've spread out the proportionate futures contracts further out down the curve in order then to eradicate this need to see such a big move like we had uh, two days ago. Uh, so it's an appropriate move, and, and again, it's attempting to control uh, the extreme volatility that we, we had seen because it was the near-term contracts that were boring the brunt of the losses that we, we, we were seeing. Um, one other thing on the oil front, uh, couldn't be better timing, of course. Uh, Donald Trump tweeting a few hours ago saying that he's instructed the United States Navy to shoot down and destroy any and all Iranian gunboats if they harass our ships at sea. So yeah, timing is obviously interesting, just given what's happening, depressed prices, this type of rhetoric traditionally would obviously support prices because it would be indicative of rising tensions in the Persian Gulf and the idea of a supply shock in more normal times would, would lift prices. Um, it comes after last week the US military vessels were conducting joint uh, integration operations in international waters in the Persian Gulf uh, and apparently they were being harassed at the time by Iranian ships of the Revolutionary Guard. Um, so there is some reasoning behind why he's tweeting it, but obviously he's tweeting it, he's keeping it behind, and now he's unleashing it at a perfect time to give markets, again, a little bit of a floor to stop the, you know, kind of forced selling in that in, in that case. So this is a little bit different to the kind of, uh, I guess, a more function way of which futures markets and the USO work. This is a little bit more in the geo geopolitical space, which has gone pretty quiet, of course, since it was all flaring at the beginning of the year. Um, how much do I think this would move oil? I don't think a great deal, to be honest. Um, it's a very short-lived in nature type headline. Um, so yeah, it's, it's worth noting. I don't think it's really really that much of a, of a big deal. Um, one thing though that I did think was quite interesting was, and something that I know my colleague Eddie's been talking about, is you know when we're, we're trying to look more specifically to equity markets, I saw an interesting headline um, citing some energy law firms this morning in, in the Financial Times, and they were saying approximately half of the 60 
independent US oil producers more likely need to review options for securing more liquidity. And it doesn't come as much as a surprise, but again, it just goes to show um, the reasoning why Trump now really has to literally do like a whatever it takes situation in order to control this. We talked about that in yesterday's video. There's the various different options he has and specifically things like utilizing the, uh, the, the strategic petroleum reserve, the SPR and so on. Um, that JP Morgan report that I was talking about uh, earlier and, and the thing it kind of fits in uh, in step with what we've been saying, they, they said oil price collapse, not a systemic risk to markets. And you know the, the underlying point they're making here is that you know, technically speaking, there is a reduced weight that the energy sector has in the S&P 500. If you think about oil, oil has been coming down quite dramatically for a period of weeks, months. And so what that's meant then is the associated values of some of the energy related companies has decreased and therefore the proportional representation of the S&P from a sector basis has got smaller. So therefore that normal correlation, which is can be quite tight between energy movement up or down and that then influencing potentially then a larger component of a stock index like the S&P to track it, uh, hasn't has broken down a little bit. As I said, we've had this massive move in oil and, and yeah, it hasn't really sold off a great deal. I mean, uh, sure, 100 points in the, the S&P, but you know, we've already recovered 100 points from the low in, in the space of 24 hours in, in that respect. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's what JP is saying, um, you know, the kind of reduced exposure of the energy sector to the SPUs, uh, asset purchase programs, basically, in large scale across many different central banks in the developed world also taking place. Uh, and then the physical production adjustments that are happening through OPEC plus and the, the G20 energy producers as well, which is going to kick in. Don't forget when we get into the month of May uh, is the expectation. All right. The other story that people are looking at, uh, and this is something definitely to be aware of today. Let me just check the calendar if they've got time for when this stuff's happening. No, no time is yet, but definitely we'll be keeping an ear out on the squawk box um, for when this starts happening. So there's an EU teleconference call basically happening uh, later on today. And the talk of the town at the moment is the European Commission floating an idea of a 2 trillion euro plan for to support the economic recovery, uh, given how dire the situation has become uh, in the Eurozone. Under the draft plan, the EU would integrate a 300 billion euro recovery fund into the 2021-27 budget and borrow around 320 billion euros on the capital markets. Um, they haven't really specified about the other remaining portions at this point. Um, Italy and Spain are demanding joint debt issuance, as you can imagine. Uh, who are opposing this. The Germans and, and Netherlands have rejected this over fears they'll be kind of stuck with the picking up the tab. You know, so it kind of harps back to the days of the sovereign crisis, similar kind of friction in terms of the contributing factors then that Germany basically gets lumped with. Um, France, they've proposed a temporary fund financed by joint issuance. And this is quite the hot topic people are looking at. Um, and they're saying it would only be operated for a few years to kickstart the economy. They're very much down the route that, you know, these countries are going to need funds, not loans. Obviously quite different in just issuing money rather than uh, having to have these countries repay. Because countries like Greece, Portugal, those that have really suffered over the last decade are going to find it incredibly difficult to survive otherwise. Uh, Germany and, and the Netherlands want to offer low interest loans which would still obviously leave uh, indebted countries, as I just said, highly uh, kind of saddled with uh, even larger liabilities, which is not going to be a healthy situation for them or the Eurozone long term. And obviously there's lots of Eurosceptics I know that have been leaving comments on the, the videos over the last few days. So this is definitely something to watch. And this call that they're having is happening later today. Markets were a little bit sensitive when they passed a previous package um, of around half a trillion more recently in the last week or so. Uh, what would be particularly sensitive is probably Italian paper. So keep an eye on BTP futures today uh, and also the euro. Uh, I would imagine these talks and headlines will probably start coming out this afternoon. But any rumors around that, um, any lack of progression, more confrontation about the best foot forward, all the time that's delayed 
all the all the longer it's going to be until they can implement some kind of fit of stimulus program to help the economic recovery and why is that important well you're going to see some economic data coming out shortly which is the flash pmi numbers for 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 the eurozone now these are going to be very important um, because it basically gives us then insight as to how bad the situation is becoming now are the pmi is going to move the market not so sure, to be honest. Uh, probably not so much as you might imagine. Why? Because last month's PMIs were already dropping quite spectacularly. So the fact that they're going to be even more depressed this time round, I'm not sure how much of a surprise that is, to be quite honest. Uh, but it does absolutely make real the idea that Europe really need to deliver something and something quite quickly at this point. Uh, the other thing here is... Uh, an article in the FT, I'm not sure if you saw it, I did also tweet this when it came out last night. Um, but in summary, the ECB have changed its rules to accept what we call fallen angel bonds. Now, what that means is that bonds that lose their investment uh, grade credit rating can maintain access to ultra cheap liquidity from the central bank. Uh, so about $275 billion worth of non-financial corporate bonds could become fallen angels by being downgraded below triple B. So when, you know, for anyone who's new to markets, basically when you think about the major credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor's, Fitch and Moody's, you have a different hierarchy and quartiles. So you have investment grade, and within investment grade will sit triple A, double A, A is the normal standard, triple B, double B and so on. But then you get down to the point of um, being downgraded below the triple B level and that then that level is the minimum required for investment grade status and that can have huge implications then for what fund managers need to hold in terms of their quality of the uh, the assets that they have from the ECB's collateral point of view to access liquidity uh, you need to exchange then a certain quality of, of goods let's say in a simple sense so here the ECB are loosening that so they're basically saying that actually they'll accept lower quality or at least those who've dropped below that threshold. And that's a move because they know that this is going to happen. And they want to reassure markets that, look, that's going to be OK. That's not going to cause a liquidity crisis and so on and so forth. Um, any questions on that? Just leave me a, a comment. Um, one of our team members, you might have seen his videos on our YouTube channel, Eddie Donmez. Uh, he used to work at Standard & Poor's, so he's great at this stuff and, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions if you're unsure. Um, final thing then, looking at the calendar, other than the flash PMIs I've already talked about, you've got the weekly initial jobless claims, of course, coming out of the States. Again, similar fashion to what we've been saying more broadly about some of the other things that have been going on. How important is initial jobless claims? Well, from an from a economic point of view, it's very important, right? Because it's going to be potentially another 4.2 million people in initial jobless claims. And that's going to take the overall five-week average above 25 million. And obviously, that means that payrolls come April is going to be pretty horrific into the kind of mid-20 millions, potentially, which is pretty amazing to think of when looking at historical standards. Uh, but to be fair, now that number generally is not so scary anymore. Certainly not as scary as it was a few weeks ago from a market function point of view in terms of reaction. So jobless definitely worth watching, and we will be. The range at the low is about three to a high of five and a half expected for 4.2. Um, but I, I wouldn't be really expecting too much unless we get an outlier shock. Um, if, let's say, jobless um, dropped to something like one million, uh, 1 million is very high, but 1 million is way lower than where we have been and what's expected and a breach of that lower end of the range. Perhaps that could be taken as positive in the short term. The jobless not quite as bad uh, after that initial peak. Uh, so we'll talk about that more um, with the guys as we get closer to the release. Earnings-wise, what have we got? Uh, I'm just going to give you a summary. Some of the biggest pre-market names, probably the biggest company to look out for is Eli Lilly. Um, and then... Going into the aftermarket space, you've got Intel, uh, which is the biggest company reporting. So they're probably the two big names if you're more of a looking at the index as a whole. Eli Lilly, uh, pre and Intel post market. All right, that is it. I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm going to wish you guys a good day. Uh, any questions, let me know. Uh, and I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Thanks very much.